6. I'll try and keep this word of exhortation fairly brief for you this morning. I think you'll be encouraged by it. Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. I wonder this morning, could we all stand, please, in honor of the reading of God's holy word? And the word of the Lord reads in this fashion. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he, meaning Philip, arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, uh, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Amen. I want to talk to you today on the subject matter of cut off. Cut off. Amen. Master, we love you. We thank you, God, one more time for this opportunity to be in this which today is sanctified as your house. God, the word of the Lord is about to go forth, and if ever we've needed to hear from you, we need to hear from you at this hour. And God, I can do nothing whatsoever. I can say nothing whatsoever that might be of a help to anyone in this room or anyone that might hear this message by tape outside of your divine anointing. So therefore, Lord, I implore you this hour, anoint me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Help me to deliver your word, Lord, fearlessly, faithfully. God, let every word that you would speak this hour be spoken, and let it be spoken in love that the hearers might receive it. For we ask it all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God. And amen. You may be seated. You know, the eunuch had a very strange place in biblical society. On one hand, they were probably one of the lowliest characters in all of the tapestry of humanity. For you see, most of the time, a eunuch was a eunuch because he had been part of a nation that lost a battle, and he was taken as a prisoner and subjugated and cut off and made to be a servant of the king. Now, a eunuch, by definition, was one whom... The king or the uh, officials in any given society would employ to oversee their women, whether that be their young girls, their daughters, whether that mean their concubines, whether that be their harem, their wives, whatever the case. But they needed men that they could trust to take care of, to guard, to protect 
the interests of their ladies, and at the same time, because they were thought so little of, they were looked at as nothing more than an animal that you could castrate. They wanted to make certain that these same animals couldn't turn around and pollute their women sexually. And in order to assure that that would not happen, they then would castrate these gentlemen. But then, interestingly enough, this poor, humiliated, captive, enslaved individual, sometimes they would aspire to a great position within the kingdom that they were part of now. Sometimes these eunuchs would enjoy such a reputation with those that they served that they would actually come to a place where they occupied very high positions and they were thought of very highly. Amen. You see, it don't matter how low a blow life deals you, listen to me now, you can still make yourself something that is noteworthy, something that people respect, something that people admire, something that people can trust, something that people can put their confidence in. Come on now. Amen. You know, there are some folks that like to run around and, woe is me, life has dealt me such a horrible blow. You know, the only way I can get anywhere in life is to steal stereos and, you know, to do this and to do that. And what they haven't come to realize is, honey, even if you're castrated, even if you're enslaved, even if you're not there by your own will, the fact of the business is you can be the best that you can be in the place where you are and you can rise to greater heights. Hallelujah. That's good news, isn't it? Amen. So see, there's hope for everybody. I don't care if you're rich or poor, it don't matter. Everybody can realize their greatest potential in God. Well, this particular eunuch that we read of in the book of Acts was one who served Candace, queen of Ethiopia. And the Bible said that he was over her treasury. He was very well trusted. He was very highly regarded. He was very well thought of. Obviously, he was not a dumb man. See, that's another mistake we make sometimes. We see people who are in a low estate. We see people who are, are, you know, in a low position in life, and we assume they're there because they're idiots. Oh, my. Did I say that? We see that homeless person on the street, and of course, you know, they must be about half stupid or else they wouldn't be homeless now, right? But you see, that's not always the case. This man was a eunuch, but he was no dummy. And he was able to come up to a position in the kingdom of Candace so that he was over her treasury, and he had great responsibility, and he had great confidence from those whom he served. And the Bible said that this eunuch was going home from having visited Jerusalem because he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Oh, my Lord. You mean there are lowly people that this old world may not think a whole lot about that actually have a mind to worship God? You mean to tell me there are folks in this life that others might look at and say, he doesn't belong here. She doesn't belong in church. He doesn't belong in church. I wonder how many today would look through the glass of this room and look at those of us here and say that very thing. He doesn't belong in church. What's he doing in church? Well, that old eunuch, don't you know the law said that a eunuch had no place before God, any man that had mutilated or destroyed in any way his male organ had, had no right to stand before God. Doesn't he know that? What did this crazy eunuch have the nerve to go to Jerusalem for? I'll tell you what he had the nerve to go to Jerusalem for. It's like this. Honey, I'll tell you what. You may not want me in your church over there. Okay, because of who I am. Hello. But I'm going to go to church. You're listening to me. One way or the other, I'm going to church. 
that old eunuch said, I might not get into the temple, I may not stand in the Holy of Holies, but glory to God, I'll stand outside the western wall, and I'll pray, and I'll sing, and I'll worship, I'll get as close as I can, but nobody is going to keep me away from God, hallelujah, and I wish to God there were more gay, lesbian, transgendered people today who had the mindset of this eunuch and said, I don't care what they say. I don't care what the law says. I'm going to press in and press on and find my way to God for myself. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Whoo, glory. I want you to know eunuchs were not somebody that God had no consideration of. He was aware of the plight of the eunuch. He was aware of the fact that they might feel they were unworthy, that they had no place in his presence and in his kingdom. I want you to know today, God is aware of your plight. He's aware that sometimes Satan would come into your mind and tell you, you have no place. You have no right. You're not deserving. And you know what? Honey, the minute you start believing that lie, that you're not deserving, you might as well quit. Because you're starting off on the wrong premise to begin with. Nobody ever said you'd deserve it. Come on now. Nobody said you'd ever earn it. Nobody ever said you could ever be it. Nobody ever said you could talk it. Nobody ever said you could walk it. But what my Bible said is, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, not of righteous actions, not of following a law, not of following rules, lest any man should boast. Nobody is going to stand before Jesus Christ in the judgment and say, I followed all the rules and lived a perfect and holy and sinless life and I deserve a place in heaven. Friend, it'll never happen. Come on now. But you know, the people that will stand in the judgment with their eyes cast down and say, Lord, I can't even imagine how you'd let me in. I did my best, but, I, you know, I was as human as could be. And the Lord will say, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. And then here comes that religious one. He'll say, hey, you, no, 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 stop here, honey. No, no, we got a place for religious folks. <laughs> yeah. It resembles a lot of your church services. People screaming and wailing and hollering like somebody being killed. Amen. God remembered the plight of the eunuch. You see, the eunuch was reading at that moment from Isaiah. And had he not bumped into Philip very, very shortly, he would have come upon this very chapter that I'm about to read from, Isaiah 56. Uh, 56. So the eunuch was only a couple of chapters away from this very thing. And in Isaiah 56, beginning at verse 3, the word of the Lord states, Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place, and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall...
shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord God which gathereth the outcasts of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. Did you hear what God just said? He said, don't even let the eunuch lose hope. Don't even let the eunuch feel that he has no place. Don't even let the lowliest member of society, don't even let that one who's an outcast at every turn, who doesn't fit in for so, so many reasons that you can't even count them, don't even let that one think that he does not have a place in my house because he does. God said, everybody that has a mind to serve me has a place. Even the eunuch, if he's got a mind to serve me, if he's got a mind to lay hold of my covenant, he said, I will not let him go away disappointed. Hallelujah. I got news for you, GLBT uh, people of Dallas, Texas. God is declaring today, it doesn't matter what or who you are, if you've got a mind to lay hold of God, covenant, if you've got a mind to keep God's Sabbath, if you've got a mind to be in the house of God and honor the word of the Lord and lift up the name of Jesus, you will not leave disappointed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Whew. See, that's what we call the gospel. Gospel means good news. And it is good news that God is aware of even our position. You say, Brother Morrow, I don't identify with the eunuch. How, how, do you, how do you see me identifying with the eunuch? Well, actually, in all reality, gay and lesbian people have much more in common with the concept of the eunuch than you might realize. You see, a eunuch was not someone always, who had been simply castrated. No, Jesus expanded the definition of the eunuch. The Lord himself came along and said, in Matthew chapter 19, he said, you know, there are different reasons, different circumstances for people being eunuchs. Matthew chapter 19, verses 10 through 12, his disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And he said, I'm sorry, it says, uh, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So Jesus says, first of all, there are some eunuchs that are born that way. See, some people were born into that position. They didn't ask for it. Come on now. They were born there. They didn't seek it out. They were born there. And then he said, and some were made that way by others. You know, there are some women today who cannot have healthy sexual relationships with a man. And I'm not even referring per se to lesbian women. It can be heterosexual women as well. Because their uncle, their cousin, their brother, somebody molested them while they were young. And it destroyed their ability to have relations with the opposite sex. They were made eunuch by somebody else. Are you hearing me? Amen. Some are born that way. Some are made eunuchs by men. Some come along. There are some boys that can't have, they don't have an interest in a relationship with the opposite sex. You know, there's always that big debate on nature or nurture. Well, Jesus just answered that problem. He said, listen, some are born that way and some are made that way. Hello now. But one way or the other, it don't make no difference, darling. A eunuch's a eunuch's a eunuch. Come on now. 
And praise God, God threw the door open to the eunuch and said, don't feel like you're an outcast. Don't feel like you have no place. You have a right. If you've got a mind to lay hold on the kingdom, you can do it. Amen. Now, isn't that good news? Amen. So Jesus, I'm going to quote for a moment my friend Sam Cater, author of the book Openly Gay, Openly Christian. He says, So the Lord himself has expanded the meaning of eunuch to include the unmarried for a variety of situations. Some were made this way by others. Some were born this way. They're unable to get married because they have no natural inclination to have sexual relations with the opposite sex. They are born that way. Others were made unable to have a sexual relationship with a mate of the opposite sex because of sexual traumas, abuse, rape, etc. in their past. For some, it is not an anticipated option. For others, it is not an option at all. The hurts and scars are too deep for whatever reason, and there are many. Eunuch means anyone not likely to get heterosexually involved. At any rate, this list expanded by Jesus certainly includes gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered people and others of either sex. Amen. So now, are you starting to understand where the preacher's been going this morning? Cut off. Sometimes people feel like, well, but I'm gay. And like a eunuch, it's something I can't change. But people tell you you have no place in the kingdom of God because this has occurred. And you're like, well, honey, I'm sorry, but I can't go back and change it. What's done is done. And I'm here to tell you that God's promise is the eunuch has a place. That eunuch had gone to the city of Jerusalem to worship God, and he didn't care about what the, the law might have said in terms of denying him access to the temple. He said, I'll just get as close as I can. I'll just go as far in as I can get. Amen. Because my Bible said that God has promised, draw nigh unto God. He'll draw nigh unto thee. Amen. So many people come into a church like ours and they say, I've had so many people come in over the years that I've been ministering in, in this capacity, and they say, Brother, I, I, I was afraid the building would collapse on me. You know, I was afraid, God, this judgment was going to fall, and I was afraid this, and I was afraid that. And I said, Well, honey, the only thing you had to be afraid of was not coming. Because God's promised that if you'll make the effort, He'll meet you halfway. God is never going to leave you disappointed. Amen. My Bible said, He that believeth on Jesus Christ shall not be ashamed. If you put your faith in Him and you leave it solely, entirely focused on Him, honey, you will not be ashamed unless you shame yourself. Come on now. But within the context of who I am, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to serve God. Brother, gay, straight, I don't care. I'm going to be in the house of God. Amen? I'm going to worship God. I'm going to lift up holy hands unto God. I'm going to shout the victory. I'm going to dance in the aisles. Why? Because he promised the eunuchs uh, that not only when they came in, brother, he didn't say you can come in and sit on the back row. No, 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 no. Go back to Isaiah. Read it again. He said no. He said the same joy, <laughs> the same happiness, the same exuberance uh, that all my people know in the house of God. He said you're going to experience the same thing. You're going to have the same thing. You will not be a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. God has no second-class citizens in his kingdom. Hallelujah. So one day, this whole thing we call Grace Oasis is going to be a shouting, dancing, running, tongue-talking, miracle-working, Pentecostal church. Amen. Amen. It's not going to be about gay, lesbian, transgender. It's going to be about God's people all coming into the right mindset. Amen. And learning to accept one another and look at one another as God looks upon us with an open heart. Amen. Glory to God. And with love and with compassion. And not once wanting to speak a word that would harm, but rather always being motivated to say something that might help or encourage 
And I'm closing right now. I told you I'd try to keep this a short word today. You know, I told Tom recently even, there are times I sit with people and we're talking, and I'll hear them say things that about curls my hair. I just say, oh, God, did they have to say that? I don't want to know that. I don't care if you do that, but don't tell me about it. I don't want to know. But you know what? I can't say anything that would discourage that person from serving God. I can't say anything that might make that person feel unwelcome in the house of God. I can't dare speak a word that would discourage them and depress them. And I told Tom, I said, you know why? Because the Lord showed me a long time ago that why do babies crawl? Why don't they just get up and walk like everybody else? They're human beings like we are. Why don't they just get up out of the womb and walk? Because they don't know how. And too many people in too many churches and too many religious movements want to push everybody into this little mold the minute you arrive and everybody has to act just the same way and here's the standard that we all live, bless God, and everybody got to be just right, everybody got to be just perfect, not understanding that in that playpen, honey, you've got brand new babies and you've got children that are five or six years old who might be able to do the things you're asking them to do, but the others cannot. So when I hear somebody say something sometimes, uh, makes me a little dizzy in the head, and I go, oh, God, why? why would they say that? I just remind myself that at this moment in their life, that's where they're at. Amen? And it would be foolish of me to voice a negative word of judgment. Jesus didn't judge the woman at the well. And I'm not to judge that person either. Because if I do, I may wind up discouraging them from trying to serve God entirely. But instead, you see, my job is to just love them. So that they can grow in the Lord. And after a while, I'll bet you a dime to a donut. Because I've been through it already many, many times. I've had people with serious sexual addictions come to church and testify. Brother Mara. I had such an addiction. I used to be in the clubs and the bars every night and blah, blah, blah. And since I've been coming to church, well, the last month, I haven't even been to a club and I didn't even realize that I had stopped going. You see? Their behavior changed and they didn't even realize that it had changed. They were just so happy with their life the way it had become that they weren't even mindful of the fact that it was different than what it had been. Amen. So you see, I could have sat there and judged that person every single time they said to me after church, well, I'm going to go meet my friend at the bar. And I, this one man in particular, I used to just go, oh, every time he'd say that, i go, oh. Because I knew, of course, that wasn't the best way to go, you know. But you see, if you just love one another, it's not all about the preacher. I'll tell you, more churches have turned out more people and pushed people away from God because of the actions of individuals in the pew than what was happening in the pulpit. Come on now. So this preacher telling you, this is what I'm trying to do and this is what I expect God's people to do. I expect us to love one another. I expect us to embrace one another. I expect us, you can listen, you can hear, you don't have to agree. You don't have to condone. You don't have to accept, but what you can do is you can understand. That's where that person's at right now. And then, if you're any kind of a Christian at all, you'll understand that the most important place that you'll ever occupy on planet Earth is the place of the intercessor. And that's right down here. Amen. You got a problem with what he said at fellowship tonight after church? Then, honey... Don't check your jaws at fellowship and chew them out. Get down on your knees and talk to Jesus about it. Because the Lord can help that man or that woman to a better place so that in the future they're not saying the same things. Amen? Amen. Are you cut off today? I'm here to tell you no. You may be a eunuch. You may have been cut off. But you're not cut off from God. Amen. God says, man can cut you off, he can cut you down, he can slice you up, he can eat you for lunch, but he cannot keep you from the love of God. 
neither death, nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things that are present, nor things that will come. Paul said, I'm convinced that there's not a thing that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Praise God. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'd ask you...